And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Goran Jovanovic, filmmaking educator and writer who had a near-death experience when struck by lightning, which spurred otherworldly phenomena and creative inspiration. Goran, thank you for joining me and welcome. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for reaching out. And um, yeah, I had a quick look at your your all those wonderful people that you've recorded and you know their stories are just incredible and are, are really even though I've had an experience I just must say before I start is like it's very clear that everyone's experience is different and so with mine please have an open mind in a sense as well just like with every others um, in my particular case it was a little bit different however if I can just say this I found one of your videos and there was a similarity within it. And it was the one with the pilot who had an NDE. He's, he went down a religious path. Mine is not a religious path, but there's similarities there. Okay, so how would you like me to start? If you don't need backstory, let's just start on the day that you got struck and go from there. Okay, so my experience started I will give you just a slight bit of backstory, and that is that I was going through a really rough time. I was going through a marriage breakup. I'd separated from my wife, and I was doing a share house with a friend, an old friend. And the reason I was breaking up with my wife was because she had joined a cult. And when she joined this cult, everything just changed Um, I changed she changed and we also have a daughter and that made things even more complicated so what happened was I had to move out because it was the right I felt it was the right thing to do and so I was very depressed as you can imagine and there was um, two storms happening and on the second storm of that night in January of 2001 I was at the refrigerator and I was holding the door of the refrigerator and my roommate was in the room just adjacent but it was an open house so he was at the dining table as I was in the kitchen and what had happened was there was this massive lightning strike which struck a tree outside of our window where the kitchen is. So it was directly behind me as I was holding onto the fridge. And in this split second, I all time just stood still. Okay, you know how they say that you're in a car crash and everything slows down. And in a split second, I could hear him screaming, all the rest of it, swearing, you know. And it was pretty clear to me that he had observed what had happened, and there was actually a light, the lightning had come from the back of me and I felt that it did and I was consumed in this white blue light and I was frozen basically like frozen in time but at the same time and remember this was a split second but I had my faculties and I can process it's just like I'm revealing this to you now however long that takes imagine that was a that split second in time. So I'm consumed with this white blue light. I can't move. I'm aware of what is happening to me. I'm aware that lightning has just struck me. I'm aware that my roommate is there. I'm aware of my life as it is in this construct of a human being. I'm aware of all this. I'm aware of everything that had happened in the past. I'm aware of my depression, everything. But the difference is that with I could hear this like clicking sound in my right ear, and I was also aware that the electricity was passing through, or what I assumed was the metallic sound was the electricity coming from somewhere, maybe my head or part of my body was arcing onto the refrigerator. And within that moment, I 
I literally just said to myself, oh, God, so this is how it ends for me. As in, I knew my life was over or I thought it was over. And the reason I said it that way was because it was a surprise. It's like I was 33 at the time or just nearly 33. And it was a surprise because I just didn't expect that this was the way that I would go. I wasn't afraid. Like there was no fear attached to it, which was in effect, maybe there was a bit of relief because it was what needed to happen to get me out of my misery because I'd been trying to get on top of it. You know, I've been trying to fix people. I mean, I couldn't even fix myself, but here I was trying to fix other people. So it perpetuated into this. I just, I've had enough. I want to leave. And so that was the moment where I had that opportunity. But at the same time, I was just really surprised by it. Once I made that realization, it jumped. So there was no transition. I just jumped from that space into a totally different space. And the other space was literally like out of space, right? Just like with the backdrop that you have behind you. And the, as I was going through this out of space kind of scenario, I was floating and the dots, which unlike space, they weren't like stars that you see and, you know, you're going through the stars, but more like energy. And then I was kind of thinking to myself, oh, so I'm, I might not actually be in space. I might actually be, it felt like, how to describe it, it kind of felt like a combination of outside my body and inside my body. So what I was experiencing, I thought perhaps was an internal thing rather than an external thing, if that makes sense, I'm not sure. But as I was traveling through this space, I had shed that depression. I had shed that heaviness of depression, you know, the, the heaviness of relationships, the heaviness of responsibilities, the heaviness of myself and who I was in on this plane. And so once I shed all that, it's only then that I could open up and feel something around me. And I felt a presence. I felt a really strong presence that was sort of traveling with me. It wasn't, I didn't feel like it was guiding me as such. It was just making itself known that it was there. Now, I must say, when I'm going through this space-like construct, um, I did not see my body. I had no body as far as I could tell. Um, and it wasn't, it was not important on any level. Like, and the being that was with me, which I could feel, I did not see anyone but I strongly felt that there was someone there with me. And it was, a, it was, if I had to put a gender to it, it was a male kind of gender, I guess, or energy. And it was loving, it was caring in a way that it just allowed me to do my thing. And maybe it was there to... If, if I started to go a bit mental or whatever, it was there to put me back on track. And that's how I kind of felt. But there wasn't any need for that at that time. And so I'm traveling and in the distance, I see a light, like a, a different kind of, well, the same kinds of lights, but it's a different in the way that it's, it's bigger. Like it's like it's the focal point of where I'm going. Unlike a tunnel. So it wasn't a tunnel light. It was more like a world or um, a ball of energy, a ball of light. And as I was going towards it, I started to think about how I'm sort of like really happy I'm moving away from whatever the hell <laughs> this is here. And as I'm doing that, I can feel stronger and stronger this presence with me, like 
but also not saying anything. And as I'm heading towards it, then I'm starting to think, okay, if I get any closer to that light, I'm really never going to come back here. Right? And so I knew that there was going to be a point somewhere that I'll be cut off. Right? And if I'm cut off, I will not know my family. I will not kind of be associated with them. It will be a totally different life for them. They will not have any contact with me as such. Um, I would have no influence whatsoever to any of these family members. And I was prepared to kind of go, okay, I want to go to that light. And I also knew that if I went to that light or I had a feeling, I shouldn't say I knew because we really don't know anything. Right? As much as what people say that we do know, we really don't know. But once I started getting closer and closer, I had this impression, a very strong impression, that if I go there, then I'm going to start a new life. But I'm not aware of what that life is. And I was also thinking about what all the other dots were. Um, I know that in one of your other videos, the gentleman had an experience where he was going through something like that, and he described them as angels passing by, and that's what the lights were, or something like that. Um, to me, that interpretation was in the time, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but my interpretation was that there are other planets or other parallel universes or other existences that I'm in or could be in. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. And, but at the same time, it's, it's also a beautiful thing because every dot is an experience. Like we can experience things in so many different ways at any given time. So, and that changes our perspective of the entire universe. So imagine one of those dots, if you go to one of those dots, it will change your entire perspective of everything. But my perspective is that I'm traveling towards this thing. And that's when I thought of my daughter. So my daughter, she was, oh, she would have been, what, three and a half or something like that? No, sorry, yeah, four or five, whatever it was. It was under five. And I thought, she's not going to have a father. If... If I don't go back, she's not going to kind of have independent thought because it might be marred by a one-sided event. Like, so if someone's teaching you something throughout your life, then it's quite hard to, you know, try and get out of that mindset and think independently. So my whole idea was, okay, well, my daughter won't have independent thinking or at least she won't have the chance to have independent thinking. And so this is where it doesn't really go against religion or whatever. It's just more about if religion's your thing, fantastic. You know, that's, that's your journey and that's great. However, if someone tells you that something is a certain way and you, you have you know, they put so much fear into you because if you try to get out of that, then it's not going to be, it's not going to be good for you. Then you lose self-control, you lose independent thinking and you lose rationality as well. So once the choice factor is out of the equation, then that's where it gets complicated. Um, so right at that point, I'm like, oh, I want to go, blah, oh, there's something else drawing me back here. Now, I could easily have gone, you know what, she'll be okay. That's her journey. I'm not responsible for that, but I am responsible for that to a certain age anyway. So at least until she gets to a certain age and then she's got, you know, she's got more of a chance to have clear thought of whatever she wants to do because she's already been fed all this rubbish from me and from everyone else that's around her, and then she'll make up her own mind, hopefully, <laughs> trying to assemble all this garbage. 
rather than someone's just saying to her, this is the way it is, you know. So there's a big kind of difference there. As soon as that happened and as soon as I had that rationale, even though I was depressed back there, back here, um, the voice, a voice, the voice, the, the entity, if you like, that was with me, said, Goran, you're going to be fine. Now, I can't say with certainty whether that was my higher voice, whether that was, some people might say it was Jesus, some people might say it's um, an angel or your guardian angel or God or you know, my, uh, Archangel Michael or whatever it is. All I know is that as soon as I said that, I was thrust or dropped back into my body, holding the refrigerator, and the lightning had just stopped. And the best way to describe it is um, if you can imagine you're full of water, and like, a, like a balloon full of water, and then that heaviness comes in and it just wobbles, you know, and then gravity takes over and you've got no structure to your bones or anything like nothing's holding you up. And I just sort of, I kind of collapsed onto the floor. And so, again, there was no, I didn't see myself outside of my body. I didn't see any of that. It was just purely from one scene to the next, All right? So it was just crash, bang. And my roommate came running over. The first thing he did was check my fingers and toes all right what's interesting though i must say is like i had um uh, mercury fillings and i had jewelry you know i had this sort of stuff i took it all off i actually had a tooth removed um which had my last mercury filling in it um so i don't know if it would have played out differently if i had metal on me or or whatnot but that's just how it ended up so I came down, uh, he got on the phone, I was pleading with him not to call the ambulance. He ended up calling, um, well, he, the ambulance was cancelled, but I think he called the, the hospital and the hospital said, no, he has to come in because he could have internal injuries, even though externally he might look all right, there could be something going on inside. And I, w I literally crawled to the hallway like I, could, I couldn't kind of stand up properly. So I crawled to the hallway and I just refused. I refused to go anywhere because I was told I was going to be fine. You know, when you have that experience and someone much more powerful than I could ever imagine, whether even if it is myself at a higher place or someone else or angelic being says you're going to be fine, then I think I'd rather trust that than... A doctor sometimes like of course if you've got a serious ailment go to a doctor but by all accounts besides you know all my hairs were sticking out the usual stuff you'd expect but I didn't have any really noticeable stuff on me like no burns or anything anyway then two weeks go go past and I could hardly walk so my calf muscle muscles had actually swollen up so much like they were like balloons and I was shuffling my feet, but that was one thing. But the worst thing was I had, um, best way to describe it is like if you got glass and you crushed it, you know, like into powder, and then you got really severe sunburn, and then you rub that glass into your skin. So that's what it felt like on the top of my feet, not the bottom, but the top for some reason. And so say I'm lying on the bed and I have a sheet over me like I couldn't have a single like a little light sheet because it would it'll hurt like so bad and so anyway I ended up going to the doctor about two weeks later explained the situation I felt like a bit of a <laughs> it was a bit weird you know like you, you got struck by lightning two two weeks earlier and my friend took me to the doctor and he's like yeah like <laughs> um but the doctor was actually understood. He was like, he wasn't saying, oh, you know, that's a lot of rubbish or whatever. He saw my feet, all the rest of it. And they took um, 
uh, some kind of scan. I think it was, I don't know if it was a CAT scan or something. But one of my, there's no blockages or anything. He gave me these painkillers. But one of my, is it, I think it was an artery or something, had ballooned or something. But that's about all that he could figure out. And he said, you know, it's been two weeks and everything else seems to be normal. So take the painkillers and, and it did, it went away. Like the pain eventually subsided and I'm back to my normal self. So that was the experience. Um, I, I suffered more after that, like emotionally, because I thought, okay, like, you know how some people, like they have this, NDE experiences and somehow they've changed but I didn't feel changed in the way of how I viewed life and my circumstances didn't change in fact they got worse um yeah with my personal life and all the rest of it and I don't know how much you want to know but um my worst fears I my worst fears happened with my daughter so the worst possible scenario you can think of that happens to a child happened in that cult which I couldn't control. So my next 20 years almost was for that purpose of why I came back but in the end it seemed like none of it mattered because I failed and you know that that's how that saga ended. But Along the way, on a parallel kind of way, something beautiful happened. And that is that I rekindled the joy of basically um, creating art, if you like. Like, so I think artistic expression is a huge thing. It also gave me permission. The, what, what the NDE did was it gave me permission to, to tell my story in a way that might offend some people. Now, what I mean by that is, as I said earlier, like I, don't, I really don't care what people's religions are and what their beliefs are and all the rest of it, as long as everyone treats each other with respect. Um, but when I was a child, I, had, I went to church like once or twice a year and I just remember as a child, I just did not understand it. Like, so it's usually Easter or Christmas. So my parents weren't highly religious or anything, but everyone else was doing it, so we did it. Um, but I've always had this thing, like, even as like a five-year-old, going to a church and I'm like, whoa, this is, this is not reality. Like, what's all this? You know, and I had a friend, I remember this vividly, I had a friend, I went to see him and I knocked on the door. I said, oh, is, is Joseph here? You know, go and play with Joseph. And his mother goes, oh, no, no. Um, yeah, but he's, he's going to go out soon. So anyway, Joseph came to the door and he said, oh, I've got to go to confession. And like, I, was, I didn't know what confession meant, like, because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't brought up Catholic. Um, and, and I said, what do you, what? what's confession? Like, I thought he was talking about some medical thing, like diarrhea or something. I, I don't know what, what I was thinking. Anyway, I explained it to him. He said, oh, I've got to tell, tell the priest about the bad stuff I've done. And, like, it really confused me. I'm like, I don't understand. Like, you're going you're gonna to tell a man about bad stuff you've done. And I said, why, why would you do that? I don't understand. He goes, oh, no, because because that man's going to forgive me of my sins. And I'm like, but why don't you just tell God? So this is my rationale because even though I'm not religious and there was something about religion I never kind, kind of liked, or it felt very uncomfortable, I always spoke to a higher being. I don't know what you'd call that higher being to me, like if you call it God or whatever, you can call it whatever you want, but it's a direct link. And surely that's a stronger 
link to a higher being than telling some random stranger about your sins. Like, I, I just didn't get it. Like, so, because whenever I was kind of feeling down or whatever, you know, and I know this is a bit weird, right? But I used to sit on the toilet sometimes when I go to the toilet as a kid. And I'll talk to God there because it's like it's a space of, it's almost like, I guess it's like a confession booth. I don't know. Like you're on the toilet. It's like no one else can hear you. So, But it felt like someone was listening, you know. And so that was my experience of confession, if you like. So, but I don't know where that came from. It's just always been like that. But what happened, what was really interesting is that well, after I had my NDE, I started getting sleep paralysis, which is something I never had before. Well, I thought I never had it before. But during the times of when I was a kid, I also used to wake up as if someone had just left in the middle of the night. And it was like my family had just dropped me off here and I'm just sitting here and I'm like, why am I here? You know? And so that aspect of it is like, I don't know, if you want to call it alien or extraterrestrial or something else, I don't know. But it was all, always this kind of not fitting into the human construct of society of what we are. But at the same time, loving people, like I love people and I, you know, I love having a good time and all the rest of it. And so when I had the NDE, I started having um, sleep paralysis. And that got a little, little bit weird because, like, as you know, with sleep paralysis, you're frozen in, in, you know, in your spot and all the rest of it. But I started to kind of feel like there was beings around me. So, like, there was something going on as well as just sleep paralysis. So me being the researcher that I am and trying to be objective with everything, I looked up sleep paralysis and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's like maybe, you know, people that think that they were abducted by aliens or whatever, they might have psychological issues, they might have trauma from a child, they might have this, might have that. Yeah, you know, I had abandonment issues, but that's about it. Um, but... What happened was after a period of time, I, when the energy was there, I kind of broke free from it. And then the next time I'd have it, I used to have surreal dreams. So then the surreal dreams started coming in where I was talking to extraterrestrial beings in my, I'll just say my dreams, okay? So in my surreal state, I... I was talking to extraterrestrial beings, beings. And at the end of the day, what happened was these beings would come and go, but in between I'd still get this sleep paralysis. So I couldn't kind of break free from that sometimes, which was the scariest kind of part. I don't like it at all. Um, and so with these beings also came fear. So then I started to fear the stuff I'd written because I also started to get automatic writing. And there was one piece in particular, which I ended up doing a short book, like it's a novella, I guess you can call it. And that was, that was probably the hardest, most mind-breaking thing I'd ever done. And it was like someone had, had, was, you know, trying to get inside me for like two or three days. And I was just like resisting it and resisting it. And then one morning I just woke up and I just, without even thinking about it, just wrote. And then I read what I wrote and I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, the world, me, every, no, nah, this is going in the drawer. And it wasn't until a few years later that I actually released it. And now with the advent of AI, I just recently kind of put pictures to it and whatever, so it's like a short kind of book thing. And, and it's like, oh, like because when it happened, it was like an alien kind of interpretation of how humanity was actually created. And I'm like, this is... 
garbage. Like, well, you know, this is too much. It's not. But what I realized over the years was that it's just a metaphor, right? It's not, um, it's not something to be taken literally. It's just a concept, an idea of how humans were created. So it's in the same vein as if you had a religious person to say, hey, well, this is how, how we are created. But then you have someone that's highly, I don't know, a different kind of spiritual person will say, no, this is how it is. And then you'd have a scientist to go, no, this is how it is. Well, what this has done is an alien or aliens or whatever you want to call it um, have said, well, look at, look at, your world and have a look at how things are working out for you. Let's face it, they're not, right? And so if they're not, then here's a little story for you. Just to swing the pendulum all the way back here so we can somehow come back here. So it's not saying that this, what I wrote or anyone writes or anyone experiences is the truth. Having a near-death experience is not death. It's something, it's the corridor to death. It is, you know, something that is made up and it's made up differently for different people who might have different agendas, although they might not know it, or it could be subconscious, it could be something that's coming from your past, it could be something else. So my experience in my near-death experience might have been totally different if I was a religious person or an atheist or something else. So everyone has something different to bring to the table. And yet people go on and on and on as if it's a literal thing. We don't know death until death actually happens. And no one that comes back has ever gone into the real death state. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called a near-death experience. And so I know this is going to upset a few people, and I'm sorry that they are upset. But at the same time, one thing I did learn is I have to speak my truth eventually. <laughs> so this is kind of what I'm doing. And I'm sorry if that was a lot for some people to process, but that's kind of how it is. I don't know how much more you want me to go on because, I, yeah, I, it's a lot to unpack. <laughs> Well, I want to take you back to the beginning. When the lightning hit the tree, did it go through the window and then hit the, hit you, or did it kind of go through the house? Yeah, so the gum tree was right behind the window, and because we had a look at it later, right? So it had a split in the gum tree, but my friend, uh, my roommate, saw it happen. It was like there was, it was like an arc went through into the house behind me. So it struck me from behind. So yeah, the lightning actually came in and hit me from behind as it struck the the tree outside, I assume, because the you know that was struck as well. Um, I actually looked into this later on because I wanted to see if other people were struck by lightning while they're inside the house. And like, wow, like there's so many. You know, like it's not, and I remember reading one in particular where there's people in a factory, and if you can imagine a factory of a huge wall, and they've got those little, um, you know, those little slits on the top with like that are windows, and like they were deep inside the factory, and lightning came in and hit someone, like from that little tiny crack in the in the window. So yeah, that's that's how it happened. And oh, and I should mention too, the um, the lights were still on. But the circuitry, it blown up the TV and all the, um, everything you plug into, like that was like the fuse had gone, but some of the, like the TV recorder or whatever it was, they, they had actually like lost, like lost power, like they're dead, they're gone. So it must have hit a different circuitry as it went through me. And the doctor, oddly enough, had actually mentioned too that, because he asked me what, what hand I was touching the fridge with. And it was my right hand. And he believes that it's just the way that the circuitry happened, that it bypassed certain, like the heart, I guess, in a way, or it could have been a lot worse. Like, 
if it if it was a different situation. So yeah. So I thought about all that stuff too, yeah. Well, I can't remember exactly what you said, but it was something like, Oh God, is this it? Mm. Was the oh God just an expression or were you actually talking to God? I was talking to God. I use the word God because I guess that's what we're familiar with. But yeah, it was a direct link. Just as as a child, when I was whether I'm sitting on the toilet or whatever, I would I would always start off with dear God, you know. And I would never say amen or whatever. It was just purely it was like, dear God, as in, can I have your attention? Yeah. But well, as a child, but in this particular case, it was like a direct um, intersection. Like it's a direct kind of conversation, I guess. Like, like God was there with me anyway. For a while, you had a presence with you. And then later you heard this voice. Did the yeah. voice come from the presence or was it from a different source? felt like it came from the presence, like from the being that was with me. But I don't, it's, it's weird because, because it was either like the, the place I was in, I wasn't sure whether, whether I was internal or external. And so it kind of at the same time, even though it was here, it felt like it was inside, like within me, like that voice as well. So it's like, because we're all connected, like it's all the connection to everything. And it's like, well, yeah, like it's in unison with whatever I am is what that is. But it doesn't mean that there's nothing special about that external force. There is. But it's just that it's, its connection is always with us anyway. So we're part of that, you know. Um, I don't know if you want to think about the best way to describe it is like, I don't know if God was a person figure and whatever, and we are we are His breath. Uh, so we're the particles, but we're still attached to that to that God figure in a way. Did this entire experience happen while you were like being shocked? So everything that happened was in that. I don't know how long it takes to have a lightning strike. Uh, I was frozen. I went to the space, darkness, whatever you want to call it. And then I was back and then I got let go. So it all happened within the time that lightning strikes, all of that happened in that time. So I did not black out. Um, I was actually rigid. I couldn't move while it was happening. And it was, yeah, like I actually saw my friend coming towards me, like when I dropped. So that's how quick it was could you say that the strike on earth only lasted for let's say 10 or 15 seconds but on the other side where you were it lasted for a minute or two or longer i'd say like if you put it in time i think the strike lasted the actual physical strike was probably a second if that i don't know i would think like yeah, because I film lightning all the time. Like, whatever you see, lightning, that's it. Like, um, less than a second. And, yeah, me being in that space, oh, it's so hard to, uh, you know, it, it's like a vacuum of time. Like, I, I really don't know. But I guess, you know, how long do you process things for? Like, sometimes when you think about stuff, it, or when you watch something, it seems longer than it is and sometimes shorter than it is. Um, I was, let's just say 10 minutes, you know, um, to give, give kind of some sort of clarity there. You said something, and if you don't want to talk about it, it's okay. Oh, but you mentioned about your daughter, and she was part of a cult that you couldn't control. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Okay, so my backstory a little bit. So I got married, um, worked at a job which I really hated, um, did 12-hour shifts um, in a factory. Um, my daughter was born, and I was away a lot. I was, I was working a lot. So when I wasn't working, I was trying to catch up on sleep and all the rest of it. 
when my daughter was very, very little, um, I saw that there was a change in my wife at the time. And I'd, I've gone to those, you know, those classes when they, you go to when someone, when your partner's pregnant and you look out for signs of depression or, or whatever, you know, like the postnatal sort of stuff. And I'm like, oh, it's not that. There's something going on. But her whole, my ex-wife's whole personality had flipped and suddenly she was scared of everything, you know. All the joy in her life had gone. It, like it's just something, like we, we had this child and like just something shifted. It's like, and I, okay, so what I didn't mention before a little bit was that I've always been kind of in the way I see things that other people don't see, like if you want to call them ghosts or whatever. And sometimes I would say something to someone, but and they're like, but there's no one, there was no one there. And then I figure out later and then I'll just be quiet because I'd always been that open-minded that to think that, you know, that what's around us, we don't know half the time. You know, there's always stuff around us all the time. Anyway, with my wife, she changed a lot and, and then she came out and told me that I should join this cult because Armageddon's coming, all the rest of it, right? And they predicted stuff before and it never came true and all the rest of it. Anyway, and then there were dangers in that cult because my biggest fear was for my daughter because they have this rule, which comes from the Bible, mind you, um, so they can interpret it, that um, at least... Two people, I think it was, have to see a child, for example, something really bad happening to them. I won't say, you know, you know what I mean, um, before anything can be done again for it, right? Before any action be, can be taken. Now, that action does not even mean, so can you imagine, like two adult baptized people have to see something happen to a child in order for it to go any further that someone else has done to that poor child. And so that's a huge fear. And the rationale was all through the Bible. So everything was biblical, right? Because you can, the thing is with the Bible, it's interpreted in so many different ways, as we know. And, you know, that, that's dangerous, you know. So my biggest fear was for the child. And then I started looking more and more into it. And that's how I ended up saying, look, it's either them or me. And then she chose them. And so I had no choice. And I thought the best thing I could possibly do for my child to have any chance, because they were at our house all the time, these other people as well. They actually had someone lined up to marry her while I was still married to her. You know, like, whoa, okay. <laughs> So, yeah, it, it got a bit nuts. Like, it's just crazy. But I thought my only chance was if I left and then at least the time that she spends with me, my daughter, then I could, you know, she could see that there's another side to life as well. You know, that's essentially it. I'm going to jump to a different subject, but can you give us a synopsis of how humanity was created? Uh -huh. Oh my gosh. Um, no, <laughs> this is a thing. Like I can, I can tell you with certainty from my experience, how I think that humanity was not created. And it's sometimes easier to pinpoint the things that don't work rather than the things that do work. And so it's almost like reverse engineering. You know, they get a spaceship and they reverse engineer it, supposedly, right, to try and figure out how it works, right? They capture some aliens, they shoot them down, whatever, magnetic rays or whatever. I don't, I don't know if any of this stuff's true, by the way, but I'm just saying, like, that's how the stories are. But you can imagine that, that parallel where, okay, we've got it down. Okay, we've got an alien. Now, 
how do, how does this work? Where did you come from? All this. Meanwhile, they're torturing the alien, right? And somehow that's good for humanity. Like so, they're reverse engineering something. So, in my view, for example, technology is a beautiful thing. Technology is where we should go. However, humans should not go there because you need to have spirituality or you need to have a connection with love and you need to understand that um, technology is, is only good when you've got good intentions for it. When you've got um, egos, when you've got, you know, if it's about money, if it's about politics, it's about religion or, you know, another agenda, it's no good for any of us. Right. So it has to start with understanding that we are here to simply observe and record. And then we go to the unknown, you know, the other place, wherever that other place is, you know. And that's the way I see it. And the reason I say that is because one of my alien experiences, I woke up paralyzed, like sleep paralysis. And then I thought, okay, well, I'll just ride through it, just ride through it. And this is when I was living by myself. So I'd separated and I got my own apartment at the time. So I had no roommate, nothing like that. However, my first book um, was just about to be published. So I'd had, I put, the publisher had it and it was about to be released. And I woke up and I'm like, oh, God, glad that's over. But there was something different about the whole place. Like, and I got up and like, I felt like there was a presence in the, in the building, in the, my apartment. And so I got up and I was walking around and I'm like, God, I swear this. Just the energy's different. Like, what's going on? Anyway, and I, there was a door that was closed, another bedroom door. And I knew that my daughter wasn't there, right? because like I had 50-50 custody with my daughter and but she was with her mother and I knew that but I open the door and I walk in and I'm like whoa there's a, a little lump underneath the, the dunas I'm like, holy shit under the what oh uh, sorry under the blanket like a duna you know okay. a duna cover okay yeah, sorry sorry um and so, and it had a child's form and I'm like, I just didn't, it didn't comprehend like what, anyway. And then I got closer and this little kid peeled the, you know, the blanket off his face and revealed himself. And that's when I lost my, I don't know if I can swear, but lost it. Right? That's when I lost it because what I saw was me myself as a kid on, in the bed I'm like and of course my brain couldn't process that anyway fast forward a little bit I chased the kid <laughs> and um and then the doorbell rang and I went to answer the door and then this being like there was more to it but just to fast forward it there's a being that came in like a human sort of form right but then as I started talking to him, he changed into, when I realized he was actually kind of alien, not human, he changed form. And then he took me downstairs right, into the courtyard and there was broken glass down the bottom in my dream. And as I was, but as I was walking down, I kept saying to him, you just don't understand how hard it is for me to do this, as in this life, right? So this is all after my MDE. And then as I was doing that, he just kind of looked at me like, what is, what's so hard about it, right? You're just here to observe and record and that's it. So this is coming from one of my surreal alien dreams, right? And and then he said to me, you're a writer. And that really 
didn't hit with me at all. It's like, I'm not a writer. I'm nobody. Like I haven't, you know, my book hasn't been published. It's probably crap anyway. You know, all the self-doubt comes in. And then um, what happened was there was all this broken glass. And I don't know why. And I suddenly was urged to walk along the broken glass. So I walked along the broken glass, got to the other end, and my feet were bleeding profusely, bleeding. And then he just stared at me. And then I understood, right, that, you know, the pain is interpreted sometimes by what we see, but not necessarily what we feel and all the rest of it. So everyone's pain threshold is different. I felt no pain, right? But I could see the bleeding everywhere. And so to me, what he was saying was, you're here to observe and record because this place is hemorrhaging. You know, this earth is hemorrhaging. We're so, we're so cruel to other people. There's not enough love, all the rest of it. And then you've, on top of all that, you've also got all these opinions and experiences, which only confuses people as well. So, you know, coming back to uh, the reason why I think that we're here is simply for ourselves. It comes back to you and what you want to get out of it. You know, it's about your experience. It's not about saving people, you know. Does, does God really need us to, you know, save people? Like if God was all powerful and everything, then God doesn't need that, you know. He's just love. It comes back to you, the individual. And you can interpret life however you want, but this, at the end of the day, it's your life, you know, and it's your experience and it's your truth, whatever that truth is. And we should all respect that and embrace that, that we're all different and that we're all having a different experience. And that's essentially it. During waking consciousness, did you ever see a UFO or an ET? Um, <laughs> I think I recorded one. It's actually, <laughs> so it's actually on my YouTube channel, but I don't know if it was a satellite or a UFO. But um, yeah, I, I believe I have. But again, you know, I see these people who, who put up photos of clouds, right? And they're like, oh, this isn't, this is, check out this cloud. It's got these shapes and this and that. They're just clouds. Like in every, you know, in every cloud, you can see a million different shapes. Um, what I can tell you is that I have lost time before. So go back to my previous wife before we got married. She lived about one hour and 10 minutes away from me, right? So I used to go and travel and see her before we moved in together. And on the way back one night, so I left, probably left her place about nine o'clock or her parents' place. And I was driving along this kind of isolated road and there was, I could see in the rear vision mirror, there's these lights like behind me. And I thought, oh, maybe it's a truck or something, you know, but then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I don't remember the rest. And I don't, I don't like, I didn't see the, the car or truck or whatever pass me. But all I know is when I got home, it was like hours later. And I don't understand. And I don't understand why. So if that's a UFO, I'm not sure. But no, I don't, I'm not one of these people that would, like, I know that some people, like, they seem to be attracted to these aerial stuff no i'm not one of those people as such do you think prior to this life you were an et and you're here this time to observe and record that's a tricky question um it's not a okay so i recently went to a medium like you know a psychic medium um i've, I've been to one before when i was struggling with all the after my nde actually when I was struggling with my sleep paralysis and that kind of stuff. And the last one I saw had told me, why haven't you done this yet? 
And when she was doing the reading, she, she said she'd never seen or felt anything like this before and she was actually afraid to, very cautious to go and explore more because she saw these beings but they had their faces covered. Anyway, but basically what happened in the reading, they, they said to her it's okay and she felt comfortable and she wasn't sure whether they were a bad thing or a good thing. I think that's the vibe that she got but they were like, She's never experienced it before. Um, but what she did say was, I guess what, they don't understand why I haven't spoken about this stuff before. Like I tried to earlier and then I stopped for many years. And then like I, I should be doing this sort of stuff. Like, and, you know, like this channel, for example, this is, I know a lot of people come on here and maybe they were told sort of certain things. I was told before that there's a possibility of that, and I'll just kind of leave it at that because I don't, I don't like to, I don't like to pollute the environment like with thought like that. It doesn't. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter because to me, whether you're from existed here in another or somewhere else in another form or not, it it doesn't really matter because what's important is that whether you're an alien or extraterrestrial or whatever or parallel universe or whatever they all have the same God, if you want to call it God. We all come from the same place. Um, extraterrestrials to me are like human beings, right? They're physical. Yes, they can appear metaphysical and all the rest of it, but they know because they're so advanced with technology and all the rest of it, but their spirituality has caught up to encompass their power as well and their you know their abilities which is why i guess they're a little bit afraid of what we're doing like you think about it like you know imagine having the same capabilities of you know aliens if you like and we're humans and we're, we're still primitive like giving you know giving nuclear weapons to primitive people like this is essentially what we're doing so it doesn't matter like you know some people might think that they come they were a, a pet before or a dog or whatever. None of it to me. Like if 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 I was an alien or I'm an alien or whatever, it doesn't matter. What matters is who I really am beyond the body, whether that body is extraterrestrial or whether it's you know an animal or whether it's us or whatever. It doesn't matter. And yeah, there's nothing special about it. Do you think that your NDE or your lightning strike was a pre-planned exit point? I don't know. Like, that's actually a very good question. I um, Some people would think that, but then I also think that so I'm one of those people that I don't believe in destiny, right? So I believe that you make your own destiny. So if you want, you, you know, you don't just sit there and go, oh, okay, well, I planned that. All right, press play. Oh, we're at that point now. We're at that point now. No, because you can change the way that you are all the time, you know, and if if that was pre-planned, just say it was, for example, you could also nip that in the bud and go, you know, my my life to that point actually changed a totally different direction. So it doesn't doesn't kind of equate to me. No, I would say no. Well, you mentioned your YouTube channel. What's the name of it so people can check out your videos? Uh, that would be uh, Gothic Zen Experience. And Gothic Zen, by the way, like because I had a film production company before, and then I got into teaching. So that's kind of like a I don't know, some remnant of some sort of YouTube channel. So I'm just sort of starting that up again because I've been encouraged to kind of talk about this sort of stuff. So I'm hoping that that would lead to a better understanding of what my understanding is and hopefully the people that, not that they need answers, but if they want to look at things from a different point of view, then they have the option to do that. If people want to ask you questions, 
should they leave you a comment on one of your videos or oh, absolutely yeah right. absolutely do you have anything that you're working on that you want people to know about um so there's a documentary which i'd like to do <laughs> I really want to say the name of it, but um, I hope no one takes it. All right. So it's, I want to call it Not Dead Yet. No, sorry. No, that's wrong. <laughs> um, not Dead Enough. So NDE, Not Dead Enough. All right. And so, yeah, I'd like to interview people with um, experiences who had an NDE and plus um, extraterrestrial maybe experiences and see if there's a correlation or if you know, there might be something there. The other thing I've done is I have pitched um, screenplays to Hollywood and whatnot, but there's one that, um, or there's two that I'm very passionate about. So I keep working on my craft as a screenwriter. And yeah, there's a TV series that I'm kind of in pre-production with, whether I can raise the funds to to make it or not, it's a different story. but. Yeah, so it's coming back to my passion, my passion of writing, um, of telling stories, of expressing myself in different ways, I guess. Yeah. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? It's not my message. But it's from a, it's a quote from a band. And just remember that this is a short-term effect. So... If you're experiencing hardship, if you're experiencing anything, this is just short term, you know, and I know that like there's a lot of people suffering all different ways. Um, and I have to remind myself, I mean, my gosh, like I had a, a British bulldog that died many years ago and I'm still kind of emotional about it, you know, like it just, it's a dog, I know, but yeah, but it's a short term effect. And, it's all going to be good in the end, hopefully. Goran, thank you for your message, and thank you for being my guest. Not a problem at all. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the Join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.